Hey, Deco Network members. Business Development Manager Zach Dumer is here with Rob Super at American Print On Demand. Rob, we're wearing some pretty cool shirts. Should we show everybody how we made them? Yeah, let's, uh, let's get into it, because we literally put the design together this morning, printed, and all the way through the cut and sew piece of it, all the way to a finished product that we're wearing right now. So I'd be happy to show you guys from step one all the way to the end. Great, let's get started, Rob. All right, man, let's do it. So Rob, um, if it's cut and sew or all over, it's really the same process at the start, right? Yeah, so it's all gonna come off a wide format printer. Um, you know, this is a CMYK printer, meaning we have our cyan, magenta, yellow, and black inks. With dye sub, there is no white ink. So the way we get our white in our design is the absence of ink. So unlike some of the other technologies like direct-to-garment or direct-to-film, you're actually applying a white ink to come out. What we're doing is absence of ink, so our products are a white base. So the fabric or you know whatever substrate we're going onto is a white base. And then we apply our CMYK digitally to scale up to 64 inches. So of course there's some printers that go larger, you know, wall tapestries, you know, flooring, things like that are gonna be above that. But it, within the spectrum of merchandise and apparel, your 64 inch is your standard. Um, right now what you're seeing printed on here is actual cut pieces that are gonna be printed to the piece of paper, the special dye sub paper that absorbs the ink, and then transferred over to our heat press where it'll be eventually released into the fabric. So let's go ahead and unpause this so you can see it in action. And you kind of mentioned something there, Rob. There's a lot of things that are, you know, this machine is used for outside of printing apparel. I mean, we're about to print a blanket. It is a fabric, but I mean, floor mats. I, I've seen that several times. Yep. Um, Anything, any, you know, both soft goods and hard goods, and this is why I believe Dye Sub is the best print technology currently in existence, is the versatility and really what you can do with it. Uh, you can do both hard goods and soft goods. Anything with a polyester coating, you know, something as simple as a drink coaster, if it has a polyester coating on it, which is, you know, a paint that's applied to it, it will absorb the ink. And it gets back to that chemistry term we're talking about. We're taking the solid ink, releasing it to a gas, and going in the substrate. It's a little bit opposite of, you know, DTG. DTG wants to go on 100% natural fibers, wants to right. absorb into there versus yep. we're not absorbing, we're dying. Correct. The yeah, at the, at the molecular level, um, you know, and to, to delve into that a little further, what's actually happening, just like the pores in your face, polyester is a smooth fiber. So when I apply, you know, let's say I'm washing my face and I heat my face up, my pores are opening. We're doing the same to the polyester fabric. We're applying heat, that smooth fiber opens up the pores, and then when the ink is in its gas form, it's actually going to go into those pores on the fiber and permanently adhere to that. So it'll never actually peel, chip, crack, fade, dull, anything. Uh, a million plus washes, the garment will fall apart before that ink ever actually leaves the product. And it never fades, I mean, like... Yeah, correct. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, it, uh, it's, unless you put it in like a 400 degree oven and cooked it, that ink will never release from the fabric. And you'll never feel it because yes, you've no dyed feel. the yeah. fabric. Yep. Very different than screen. I mean, every other process, it's not a dyeing process. Yeah. It is laying something on top of the fabric instead of putting yeah. it into it. Yeah, one of the hardest things for people to wrap their head around is all the substrates start as a blank canvas, meaning it's a white product. Yep. If I were to dye sub on, let's just say, a, a tan polyester, I could do it, but the fact that I have a tan base already in the fiber is going to mess with my colors. Yep. So they're not going to come out color accurate. Um, and again, that's why we use a white base for pretty much any type of uh, dye sub product, whether it's a hard or soft good. Well, it's essentially the same thing if we're printing on paper. I mean, we're always yeah. starting on white. I, I, if exactly. I need it to look like that, I need it yeah. to start on that white and then I'll use CMYK to actually create the full color Correct. spectrum yeah. to create that print. Yeah, and that's and it's, uh, you're hitting on a key piece there too, is uh, one thing for understanding the artwork is there's two different color spectrums. There's the RGB, our red, green, blues, and our CMYK. So we always want to design with consideration to CMYK because these are actually physical pigments we can achieve in the physical world. RGB is a digital spectrum. So I always caution my 
clients, you know, make sure you're designing with CMYK. We can hit any spectrum within CMYK as long as you're staying within that palette. You know, if I start going and throwing these uh, crazy exotic RGB colors in there, you might not come out color accurate on your finished product. So designing with that intent, you're going to be able to really unlock the full potential of the die sub platform. I mean, yeah, it's very much, it's not an analog process. It's 100% yeah. digital. Correct. How long has the process been around roughly for, Rob? You know? I, I think Dyson itself has probably been around for 20 plus years. Um, you know, digital really didn't come into fruition until the early 2000s. Yep. Um, you know, with the advent of uh, the modern day computer, you know, that's where we really started to see it. Um, you know, I know uh, one of the early adopters, they were taking an eco solvent printer and putting Dyson ink in it and converting it. And that's really how the market got started. Now these are purpose built machines. Um, you know, in relation to some of the bigger printers out there, so this would be even considered small. You know, they go all the way up to the size of this room. And what I, what's really cool about this is, so, so what we're printing right now is a cut and sew um, product because you can see we have different panels here. I mean, that's a front and a back of a shirt. We have sleeves, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. So this is printing again on two scales. So this is a 64 inch wide paper. And what we're seeing right now is the individual pieces that we're going to eventually cut out and sew together. So this actually happens to be, and I know it looks a little foreign to the uninitiated. This actually is a, is a hood liner. So this is the inside liner of a hood piece. These two pieces will get sewn together and then that hood would go up and over the head. Uh, what we see behind here is actually a sleeve piece. So this is actually a sleeve that gets folded around and sewn just like this polo. It started with base pattern pieces like this that we printed out and then die subbed. Really cool, Rob. I mean, again, like you see these wide format printers and so forth. It's not that hard to send a print to a printer and print it, but then it gets harder. And that's what I want to start showing now. Like, how are we going to transfer this to a shirt to make it? Yeah, so depending on the type of product, you know, there's going to be anywhere from two to seven steps between this and the finished product. Um, I'm a digital guy. I, I've never been screen print. I've never been any of these analog print types. I love the fact that it's digital. You know, to your point, it's very easy to take an image um, off your computer, rip it through our RIP software, where it converts it into our CMYK colors, send it to the printer, and we have these beautiful color outputs. Uh, everything downstream is where things get uh, more, more challenging. And depending on the product type, um, you know, it escalates exponentially. Well, what do you say we start printing some stuff? Awesome. We printed our transfer, now what are we doing? So this is step two of the process after coming off our digital printer. Um, we're gonna go to a calendar heat press. So this is good for roll to roll or roll to piece applications. Roll to roll meaning a roll of printed paper and a roll of unprinted fabric. So what we have here is we're loading it up onto our table and then we're gonna go through the calendar press. Uh, so what's happening here is same thing with uh, the Oliver print, it's uh, temperature and pressure. So we're at 400 degrees for anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute, going around to oil-filled drum. So the oil-filled drum is both doing, is doing two things, both applying pressure and the heat. So by the time we get to the end of the oil-filled drum, our sublimation process has happened. We have enough dwell time. And then on the backside, we're gonna have our finished product. So this is raw fabric. You know, again, you can see it's 100% white, uh, clean slate. Underneath, we have a die sub paper making contact with that. It's gonna go through the calendar press. And then on the backside, we're gonna have a finished design. So why don't we go ahead and step around here. We should see some products starting to come out. Oh, wow. Look at that, just peel right off. And that is dye sublimation right there, isn't it, Rob? I mean, we're yeah. literally dyeing the fabric with the, the sublimation transfer. And um, you, you call it a calendar press. I call it a uh, cylinder press, but I'm not really knowledgeable. About it. What makes it a calendar press? I don't know that I could tell you that either. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, you know, the, again, the, the concept is there's different varieties of them, both the size of the drum. This is a 10 inch drum. You know, I've heard of all the way up to, you know, 30 inch drums. And that really impacts the speed, how fast we can do the die sub process. Um, the core concept remains the same. We're applying heat and pressure. On the back side here, what we're doing is we're taking our waste paper that we'll recycle later on in our fabric here. This uh, will go over to step three here in a moment and be cut out. But these are all our pattern pieces here that are eventually going to turn into the finished product. Wow, and how many uh, panels are we printing for just, you know, one of our shirts that we're going to make? Uh, yeah, so, you know, it's a simple t-shirt, right? So let's break down the components of it. Yep. We have our front body panel, our back body panel, two sleeves, and a collar, right? So something like a polo is going to be a little more complex, right? We have all these individual little placket pieces that go in here, the collar. Uh, we still have our sleeves and the bodies. Uh, hoodie pieces, you know, you've got your sleeves, your pocket, your hood liner, your actual hood exterior. Uh, so it really depends on the product type, um, you know, the, uh, and that's the beauty of this technology is with the same application here, I could have a t-shirt, I could have a performance pullover, I could have a polo, I could have a hoodie, you know, I could do blankets, I could do kids products. Just have to start with some synthetic material. Look at that Deco Network logo. It looks, looks so vibrant. Yeah, and this is a very high polyester based content on this and that's why it's the colors are just really popping off the page at you uh, and again you know like we said earlier none of this will ever dull fade chip peel crack this is a performance based fabric we're actually using here so this has spf in it moisture wicking capabilities and that's really one of the selling points of the polyester yep is you can get into those territories you know we have a more natural feeling uh polyester that feels more similar to cotton uh but this is like your athletic uh you know outdoor wear um you know when we're in a hot environment like we are right now, it's nice to have that uh, the cooling effect uh, and also a little sun protection to boot. Well, and something you mentioned earlier is polyester has really changed in the past, what, 15-ish years. It, it yeah. used to have a negative connotation. It's not soft. It, it doesn't, right. yeah. it's not cotton. And, and I've, I've come to the, I don't want cotton as much. I want a blend or I want 100% poly. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's the, the, you know, even in just the short time I've been doing it in the last five or six years, the advances, you know, when I first got into it, I could not find a polyester that felt natural. You know, it all felt like synthetic you know had a rough hand feel um not quite as bad as our 70s uh you know 70s uh wear that you know our parents were akin to but uh it, it just never really for me was a, that appealing um you know and that was one of the things i did early on too was try to develop my own fabrics and say okay what blend gets us a really nice hand feel uh but in the last five years it's really just accelerated the types of products you can get uh the types of hand feel uh we have anything from a fleece uh to a canvas duck material that are all polyester base uh, again this is a, uh, you know more of a performance base very soft and stretchy um, and if you get into the nuances of it you have two-way stretch you have four-way stretch meaning I can stretch this fabric vertically or on a four-way stretch I can go horizontal and vertical oh, wow. and so in a performance application that's what we want right we want that stretchability and you know a lot of people are wondering probably, you know, what are the barriers to entry? There's a lot to learn. I mean, I didn't know you could stretch something two ways or four ways. Um, you know, if somebody were to get into this market, um, equipment, probably not as easy to select as like select an embroidery or screen printing machine. Right. As far as your material, I bet that's not always, you know, not all the poly is created equal. Created equal, absolutely. I mean, and then as far as ink goes, um, you mentioned it earlier, and I completely agree, there's a lot of ways I can cut cost. Ink is typically not one, not of, them. one of them. Not one I of them. I want yeah. something that performs, yeah. and I want a reliable relationship right. with my vendor to actually, you know, support me if I ever get in the bind. And sometimes you put that cheaper ink in a printer, and you're going to pay yeah. for it later on. Yeah, I don't go do, you know, uh, the best analogy there is I don't go do a top fuel dragster and take pump gas. You know, yeah, yeah, my 87 yeah. regular grade that I'd put in my Prius, you know, I'm not going to go do that with my top fuel drags or same with your printer right and think you know when you really break down stuff too is you want consistency you know if i have coca-cola as a client and they want coca-cola red 
my colors can't drift. You know, I got to keep the product consistent. And that starts with all the way back at the printer with the ink. You know, it's hard enough as is, but if I go and start using substandard product quality, it's really going to be hard to manage and maintain uh, because environmental impacts, you know, printers drifting, uh, changes in the in the, uh, the RIP software, you know, all these little things add up to the bigger picture. So you really have to stay focused on that and make a consistent platform. So it starts with the printer, the ink, the paper. Uh, anytime we make a change, we notify all of our customers and say, hey, you know, we're changing this. Uh, we want you to check our colors. We'll send you some samples, make sure they're still good for you. Um, even something as simple as changing this uh, heat press by 10 to 15 degrees could change our finished product. Oh, yeah. uh, so there's a really a lot of little technical details um, that make that barrier of entry, uh, especially on the knowledge side of things, a uh, heavy lift. You know, when you go out, you can't find this information freely available. Um, you know, it's all, you know, for me, it was trial and error over the last few years to really, to really dial this process in. Okay, we're at uh, step three of the process. So now that we're coming off our heat press, we have a roll of fabric. Uh, and we're doing roll to roll printing. So I had to take my roll of fabric, completed, die sub, ready to go. We're loading it onto our vision laser cut system. So what we're doing here is actually pulling the fabric through. We we'll use a camera and a combination of technology and a CO2 laser. And we're actually going to cut the pattern piece out and then it'll be ready for sewing uh, when we get to the next step. One of the key advantages of this is uh, it creates a sealed edge, so it's easier to work with. Uh, the other thing is it's just laser precise. So between the you know the camera software, cutting the edge of the piece out, back in the day, you know, you'd get your old rolly cutter wheel out, and I'd have <laughs> to hand cut, you know, very inconsistent. You had to have higher margins, you know, your product tolerance, uh, that all drifted. With this, we can be laser precise each and every time, and it's a lot faster, safer, and just better overall. Overall. So we can go ahead and demonstrate the cutting of the piece here. So we're registering our cut line and it's just gonna mirror the edge of that, that fabric on the pattern and cut it out. Now, Rob, when I think of a decoration process like screen printing, M&R wants to sell me a printer and the dryer and the washout booth. Like, it, they try to make it as turnkey as possible and give me everything I'm gonna need. Were you, you know, was it that easy for you to buy your printer and then buy your heat press and buy this, or is it just having to connect all the dots yourself together to make it? Yeah, that's, um, you know, sp specifically when you're talking about the cut and sew process, there is no one turnkey package that I've ever seen in my, you know, history of doing this that said, hey, here's step one through five, here's the equipment you need, here's the supplier that can, you know, provide you with all that. Um, it was a lot of trial and error, a lot of research, a lot of just, uh, you know, hours and weekends figuring out what is the appropriate way to do it. I've been very fortunate networking with people in the industry, um, offering up advice, and that's something I will freely do to anyone, uh, you know, get in touch. Uh, I'm a wealth of knowledge in this space, uh, and I'm happy to share that with people that are interested in it. It is a fascinating technology, but it's not for everyone. Um, you know, it, uh, it definitely, you need to have a manufacturing background or, you know, um, some sort of mechanical aptitude, because there's a series of different equipment we need from step one to five. Wow, that, that is, again, we are not printing, we are manufacturing right now, Rob. Right, so now this is a uh, raw cut pattern piece, and actually what we're looking at here is a sleeve. So in the sewing process, this is gonna get rolled up and sewn together. So you can see kind of the makings of a sleeve there. What we're missing is, you know, the rolled head, rolled hem for the, uh, the cuff opening. This will connect to the body. Uh, what we're seeing here, this is a drop scoop hooded shirt. So this piece is getting cut out. Uh, it's got a scoop hem to it, so it's a little bit longer. Front and back body panel, and then the hood pieces will follow up behind it. Cool, Rob, are we about ready for step four? Yeah, let's move on to sewing. on step four? Yeah, we're on step four, and probably the most important and critical process of it all. We're, uh, we're sewing the finished product. And this is a serger here, so what we're doing is actually binding two pieces of fabric together. So this is a front and back body panel.
So she's sewing initially the inside, like this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. again, I've never yeah. had to, I've never seen a shirt made yeah. like this. So yeah. I'm used to yeah. printing on the front of the shirt, not sewing yeah. it from the inside out. Yeah, when you go, when you know, when you go down to the uh, store and you pick out something and wear it, you don't typically think about, whoa, boy, how did this get put together? Um, so if you were to flip, flip a shirt inside out, you'll see this, you'll see the serge inside there. And that's, uh, again, it's binding the pieces together. And you know, there's different varies, you know, get anywhere from four to six. Uh, we're doing a four here on this shirt. Uh, that's gonna give it a nice, uh, nice feel, but also the longevity and durability we need. Really cool. And, and obviously some products are harder to put together than others, right? Correct. Absolutely. Uh, and, and another consideration too is the types of fabrics make a big impact on it. This is a pretty easy fabric to work with, but let's uh, talk about something that's even a more high stretch, very high yield fabric. Uh, that can be difficult. You know, if it's a slippery fabric, it can be hardly really so. Slippery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my you know, gosh. Um, fleece, uh, fleece is typically really easy to work with until it gets to the point where it's thick enough fleece that it's difficult to run through the machine or it clogs up pieces of the machine. Uh, so there's all these different aspects you have to consider when uh, doing a variety of finished products. And that's why you have so many different machines yep. for all those different situations. Yeah, I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, but the right tool for the job is critically important. Um, you know, from step one all the way to step four in sewing, uh, you know, you really need to dial in that process to put a quality product out there that could be retail ready, hanging in the stores. But it's not like going to your local, you know, I mean, I could go to a lot of different yeah. screen print vendors, sell equipment, they're like, right. hey, we can make this turnkey, here's your whole setup. You didn't have that. I mean, you yeah, literally there, had there, to figure this out. There's no Sears catalog that's gonna give us, uh, you know, from A to Z on this. There's a lot of trial and error, uh, a lot of research, and, uh, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, but we've got the process dialed in now, and you can see she's near and finished completion here on this, uh, uh, hooded shirt, short sleeve shirt. So Zach, you're gonna be looking pretty fresh here in a moment. Well, and Rob, I'm sure like each product is different as far as how much time it takes. But if one person was sewing this, you know, cut and sew shirt all by themselves, how long would it approximately sure. take them? Well, that's always a, uh, a fun topic that I have with the ladies here. And uh, I always joke, uh, yeah, they can do a shirt in like three minutes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, see what I can get for a rise out of them. Um, you know, it, it, it's really it's really dependent on the product type. Uh, you know, it's gonna vary. I would say our goal is, uh, you know, under 10 minutes for a t-shirt. Um, and that's pretty aggressive, you know, when you consider uh, all the different pieces of it. We're just doing step one of the sewing process here, the surge. We also have to hem. Uh, um, and we also have to, uh, you know, do a couple, couple other finished techniques on it. So, um, yeah. Any so you could, I mean, literally, I'm not saying this is how you ever want to run it, but you could go from completely raw materials, nothing has been printed. You have the artwork to going from printing the transfer to heat pressing the, uh, marrying it to the uh, substrate, cutting it, and then sewing it in less than an hour, technically. It, it, it's plausible. It's, it's, yeah, it, we've we've had those rare instances where a critical customer has called in something in the morning, say, hey, I need four to six of these uh, on, on, you know, overnight. And, uh, you know, with the process being digital, we can go all the way from the, the digital uh, computer screen, step one, to the finished sewing. Very cool, Rob. Well, Rob, thank you so much for your time. It's been yeah. a pleasure. And if you have any questions about all over sublimation or cut and sew sublimation, you need to come check out AmericanPrintOnDemand.com. Rob Super is the expert at sublimation. Um, and thanks for watching. Thanks.